communicate with our customers. And we've got a really cool panel of folks to chat about this today. Hopefully you'll get some valuable information out of this in ways that you can apply this for your business. So uh, without further ado, let's bring the uh, the panel in and we'll uh, do some introductions here and, and connect with everybody so that we can say uh, say hi to everybody and, and learn who you are. So uh, welcome. Uh, first of all, in the top left-hand corner, we have Kathy. Kathy, give us a quick little introduction as to where you're from and uh, what you do. Sure, sure. I am a marketing consultant and I live in Austin, Texas, and I've worked with HL Flake for over a year as well as one or two of their customers doing marketing and email marketing for Locksmith Business. So hello from Austin. Very cool. What what specifically would you categorize that a marketing consultant does? What would they do? Well, there's lots of different marketing consultants. Uh, I happen to be very niche. I mostly do industrial distribution and I do technology. Okay. It can be anything from lead gen, finding new customers, retaining, uh, building a website, building leads, uh, collateral, how do you promote, how do you retain, how do you get referrals, um, really anything marketing strategy and budget, anywhere from internet marketing all the way down to handshake. Very cool. Thank you very much, Kathy, for being here today. Uh, we also have Tammy with us from Bysher in St. Louis, Missouri. Tammy, how are you doing? Doing good. Thank you. Give us a quick little inter introduction to Bysher. I know I, I feel like Ted has been on one of these round tables, but give us a quick little introduction. Uh, so Bysher is um, a lock and security company in St. Louis. Um, we also have an AV company, uh, partner company together um, that does uh, security and home automation, audio and video. Um, and I, with COVID, just kind of needed a new job and he was looking to expand his uh, marketing. So I started with them back in uh, April. Very cool. So, but my husband's been there 17 years. So yeah, Mark, Mark has been there for a while and you guys are, have really taken on uh, the focus of marketing in a whole new way over the past couple of months, which is really cool. Uh, be glad to talk about that. And then in the bottom left-hand corner, Thomas is with us. Thomas, give us a quick little introduction. Uh, where are you, where are you from and, uh, and who are you with? Sure, absolutely. Thomas Nettesheim from Constant Contact. I am in Florida, the sunny, sometimes rainy state of Florida, and been working at Constant Contact for almost 10 years and been focusing on, on franchise and partnership relations for five years. So I'm able to do training, subject matter expert, able to hopefully give you a good idea about why email marketing matters. Very cool. And Constant Contact, just for people that have no idea, what is Constant Contact? Yeah, so Constant Contact, the main thing that we're known for is email marketing. We've been in the email marketing space for 25 years. We more recently have delved into a full marketing suite. So offering social media, Google and social ads, website building. And the main focus, of course, is the email side, but making sure that we give the tools necessary to put a conglomerate and everything in one spot. So that way it makes it easy to market. Very cool. And then last but not least, obviously, is the man himself that probably needs no introduction. Ken Kupferman, how are you doing, sir? Excellent, sir. Thank you for having us. Well, it wasn't my choice, but we're glad to have you here nonetheless. <laughs> <laughs> I, I enjoy... And your wife for this one? Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I enjoy having good conversation with Ken because uh, he, we, he's been a major component of our regular weekly business meeting conversations. Um, and I think we've all grown a lot over the past couple of months. And so I really appreciate uh, Ken and him being here today. He's been doing email marketing for a long time. But Ken, give us a quick little introduction to who you are and, and where you're from. So I'm the owner of Affordable Lock in uh, Central Florida. We have seven locations from Tampa to Orlando and up to Ocala. So we cover the whole cent central part of the state. Very cool. And uh, we appreciate appreciate you being here today. So the subject of email marketing. So I, I'll, I'll kind of toss this maybe uh, to Kathy first. How does email marketing play a role in your overall strategy? Because it's not the only thing is I think we we will we'll dive into that at some point. That's not the only thing. But how does that play a role into your overall marketing strategy? Yeah, you know, I wish I wish there was just one thing that people needed to do to grow their business. There's no such thing. It's really an integration. Um, a business owners love to point at just one thing. And if they could just do this one thing, they could build a business. But really, I think email is a very important part of their their overall marketing strategy and communication. Um, 
communication is not linear. It's not like in the old days where you mail something and then maybe 3% of the people call you to respond. Mm -hmm. Um, It's really just an integration of everything. You know, you've got Facebook, especially for locksmith, you've got Facebook, you've got LinkedIn on the commercial side. Um, I think text plays a role. Um, Email has a lot of different facets of it. And, and, you know, without segmentation, email may not do well for everybody, but um, you know, there's, there's email 101 and then there's email 201. And so people usually look at that and say, I can't catch up. I'm not even going to try. I Mm. can't even collect email addresses, but I think it's a very important purpose. It has a a really important purpose, not just for um, customer retention, but, but new business and referrals as well. Very cool. Thank you, uh, Kathy. Uh, Thomas, obviously this is kind of your bread and butter with email marketing. How are you seeing people and, and has that changed even over the past couple of months? Have you seen an, an increase in email or is it a decrease? What is the kind of the, the, the climate right now with email marketing? Yeah, absolutely. And especially with the time that we're in, people have to get creative, right? In the ways that they communicate, in the ways that they interact with their Uh, customers. So increase in digital presence as a whole, but email marketing is absolutely hitting. Um, I did pull up some stats. There are 293 billion emails sent out and received every single day in 2019. And that is still projected to go up to almost 350 billion by 2022. So, I mean, it's still a growing business. It's still a growing opportunity, but to Kathy's point, making sure that you incorporate that with every other aspect of your marketing. So some things that we have seen that have changed a bit is incorporating more action items like polls into the body of the email to gather feedback or being able to point people to events at, that you're hosting right through there or even doing automation and segmentation to make sure that you are sending out those targeted messages. Those are some ways that people are really starting to get serious about in their email marketing and they're really starting to see that return on investment, which also has actually gone up over the past couple of years. It used to be for every dollar spent, you get about a $38 return on investment that has gone up to between 44 to $50 return on investment, depending on if you're working B2B or B2C. And um, so it is showing that it does continually um, give you the opportunity to get in front of customers and grow. And and at the end of the day, which I think Kathy was kind of mentioning it, like the the old days of maybe it's direct mail marketing or whatever, that that way that you're, you're trying to get that message out, it's so different now and it's, it's a lot easier to bring things to market, to bring things to your customer's attention. And, and to that point, sometimes it just turns into a lot of noise. And so then trying to really be very directive in the message that you're trying to, to get across. I think you, you said it very well, Thomas polls, events, trying to figure out ways to get feedback from your customers so that it's not just Hey, this is, this is us. Hey, this is us. These are the products that we can sell, but actually trying to find ways to create value. I think uh, one of the things that Bysher is doing very interesting is trying to take a very creative approach to creating value and value added content for their customers. So Tammy, share a little bit about what you guys have instituted just even over the, the course of the last few months. Um, we had an interesting struggle because we have the two different brands, um, and our constant contact is one list. So we were trying to find a way to send a message that was relevant to the lock customers, but also engaged with the AV customers and vice versa. So we started something like a what's happening at Bysher brand, and we split the email on the template. One side talks about what's happening at lock and one side talks about what's happening at AV. Um, so when we send something out, we can see, um, you know, maybe some of our lot customers saying, Oh, wow, I didn't realize you did that or vice versa. And we've been just kind of trying it. We've had good click rates and and not a lot of unsubscribes. So I guess it's working. Um, so leveraging the fact that your your one list was combined and kind of cross-referencing. So, hey, to our lock customers, did you know we have an AV, but just kind of creating the value side of, of what that does and the same customer base maybe didn't know that you did the, the lock and security products as well. Right, right. But trying to make the email relevant so nobody's like, why am I getting this? Um, you know, everybody can see something hopefully that interests them from the start. What, what have been the, the types of things that you guys have had to work on to try to come up with like, 
what is value add information for your customers that is actually going to connect with them and, and they actually enjoy the reason that they're getting the, the email versus just going, Oh, what, like this is just another advertisement. Oh, um, <laughs> cause you guys have instituted a pretty, yeah, you, you guys have instituted a pretty specific strategy to be able to do that. You know, coming up with topic ideas, like how is that, work for you versus just throwing out an ad of this is our company? Well, so because we weren't doing a lot of anything before, it's kind of hard to compare the two. Mm -hmm. Um, But what we, what we did was we have direct um, calls to action that's clicking them through to our page. um, And we're, we're staying relevant. You know, we did a, a big COVID push, like what are we doing to keep our customers safe? And that was really relevant to pretty much anybody. Um, and then we were, we kind of tied everything back into what is happening around us. So it's all, you know, even our calls to action, um, or our, our blog posts, you know, we're trying to push that through email a little bit. It was something that, you know, hopefully they would find something that interested them from clicking through or even from just reading it. Um, I don't know, again, we didn't have a lot of comparative data, so we just kind of went for it and, and we were hoping it worked. Very cool. So let me jump down to Ken. Cause I know Ken has been a big proponent of emails uh, in monthly newsletters for quite some time. So Ken, what is, what's, how is, how has that process worked for you? And, and what is the value that you've seen? Cause you, how many years have you been, you guys been doing that? So we, we probably started about 10 years ago, sending out a monthly newsletter. Um, it's, it's incredible. Um, you know, my, my thought on it is you got to stay in front of people for them to remember you. You know, it's not like you're using a locksmith every day or security. You don't need that every day. So we're just pushing our name out there, keeping it, keeping us relevant in front of the customer. And it, uh, it works out well. Usually when we send out, uh, a, a newsletter, we always get a couple of responses. Oh, I meant to call you or, you know, we need service on this. And, um, so not only um, putting information out there, but but we always get that uh, response back, which is nice. Well, and there was something else that I remember you sharing a couple of weeks back about not only do you do the monthly newsletter, but you also do kind of some customized special emails to new customers uh, that, that come specifically from you. So what we do is um, two weeks after we service a customer, we send out an email blast thanking them for their service and letting them know about other products that we, uh, other products and services that we have available. And, and you've been doing that for a, a number of years as well. And basically the, the conversation we were having was you're, you're seeing just a lot of value in just the, the communication with customers and just trying to one, show your appreciation, but two, trying to find ways to continue to show value, which I thought was a, a great idea. I actually borrowed that idea from you. I haven't instituted the email portion of it yet, but started to cr- kind of curate a list of those customers that we serviced two weeks previous um, so that we know who that we need to contact. So I think it's a really interesting perspective. Well, that's what this is all about, sharing ideas and, and growing because of it. So, Kathy, I want to come back to you from a from a, a, a consulting standpoint. So I would imagine since you do a lot of work inside the industry, you've probably seen some good marketing value and some bad marketing value. What is what is the typical approach uh, that that the locksmith industry typically takes versus some of the things that you're helping to consult with and say, hey, this may be a better way to look at it? Yeah. Well, I think the typical is to do an email blast and do it once a month and send it to everyone. Right. That's the old that's the old model. It's a lot harder to segment and choose which services you're going to send to which people. Uh, Prime example is me. I've been in my house 14 years when I bought it. It had a security system. So I signed up with a security company right away. Uh, About 10 years later, I realized I thought I might want a camera and I might want to have a garage door app. Mm -hmm. And in that 10 years, the company that I was buying from actually was sold to a different company. Mm -hmm. And I never got any email or a phone call or anything that told me that, yes, indeed, they did have cameras and a garage door app. So I was looking in a magazine and saw an ad from Alert 360 and called up my current security people and found out not only did they have all those services, but I had a great sales guy that was local. and He came in to see me the next day. So when people say that email bothers people, it's the kind of email that you're sending. But if, if you you really got to know who your customer database is and who what they're buying from you. 
Um, so many companies won't take the time to hire someone to do some Excel work or some access work and really, really understand, you know, who's buying from them. And what are they buying? Almost all of my neighbors have a security system. Not everybody has cameras. And I probably once a week have someone ask me, where'd you get your cameras? That's where Facebook comes in. That's where referrals come in. So the one size fits all in the monthly blast. It's not segmented. It's not customer specific. Yeah, you might get 3% hit click rate or you might get even a 30% open rate. But how many of those become a quote, you know? So for me, you know, if someone was going to start out with email, first of all, you got to start collecting email addresses and make sure you get permission. There's all kinds of can spam rules about spamming people. But the big thing for me is, you know, you've got new product you're trying to sell. You've got upgrades you're trying to sell. There's a new, new business funnel that you've got to do. Um, you know, it takes time to build those things. And there's software out there like Constant Contact and some other ones that are a little bit more sophisticated where you can create these drip campaigns that are very sophisticated and your salespeople can see right away who not only did they open, but where did they click on your website? And was there a little pop-up box that said, call me or text me or email me. So it's, it's really, you know, at, at first glance, you'll just say, yeah, email is just a pain. I hate email. That's not what it's for. So, you know, from a consulting standpoint, you try to get, an understanding of what it can do. Mm -hmm. And then it's fun because then you've got business owners that, Hey, we should be doing more cameras. We should be doing more garage door apps. We should be doing more, whatever it is. And that's when the fun starts is when you can have somebody actually execute the ideas that you have. So through I, email and other things. Uh, so I want to ask you this question because I, I think you just brought up a very, very good point that we had in one of our, our business meeting conversations at business meeting dot online, uh, mm -hmm. se probably several maybe a month or so ago was customer utilization. So, yes. you know, we all have a customer list and then, but do we have a good concept of, you know, for us, we have kind of four categories, locks and keys, cameras, key card systems, and, and doors. Do we mm -hmm. have a good understanding of customer a, do they use one of our service categories or do they use all four um, versus uh, you know, maybe two of them? So do we have a good understanding of that? Do we have a good measurement on it? Because the likelihood you, we've already done the hard work. We've already done the hard work of capturing them as a customer for one of those categories. And if we can get right. them to take advantage of the other three, then we're going to, we're going to really win. And if they're already using all four, then now what, how do we, how do we uh, send them additional information that's going to be beneficial to them? So I think that's, that's very interesting. Do you see kind of, kind of hanging with the, the topic here? Do you see uh, our, our typical process? I, I feel like the urge for us is, as businesses is to just, for lack of a better word, vomit out all of the list of services and products that we offer versus yeah. trying to be very specific in what we, and what we're trying to communicate. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think in answer to your question, I think if you have a, any kind of a business system where you have a skew for a service, it shouldn't be that hard to output to Excel and find out what you have. Right. I mean, it, it just takes a little bit of brain power to look at the Excel sheet to see what you're selling into people. I know on the commercial side, um, one of the distributors I used to talk to used to count, there was how many doors were on the building. And that would be a gauge of what kind of business could be there, how many doors. So I think for a residential, you've got to figure out, you know, what you're looking for. It may just be a zip code, you know, that these zip codes tend to have more disposable income than others. And these are the kind of services they look for, or this is the good, better, best camera I should offer, knowing people are going to pick the middle. Um, you know, I, I don't know if every locksmith today knows their data. I bet you 2% do. Um, but until you understand, like you said, like you don't want to vomit. And I, I see all kinds of, of uh, magazine one page ads in the, in the home remodeling magazines that I get every week. And I'm sure a lot of you folks get them as well. Um, the ROI on those is very low versus a Google ad or, uh, you know, to me, email is very inexpensive to do, to be honest, even if you're paying twelve to $2,000 a month for a service. I just think that's cheap compared to a $10,000 ad that maybe it runs for five days. So I think the internet provides, you know, more people to raise their hand to say, I'm interested. But yeah, I mean, if you don't have a real good 360 view of your own data um, and who's buying from you and when and how often, I mean, even if someone is buying four or five services, you know, there can be a referral for you. So, you know, whether it's a business card or an email forward or a Facebook like, whatever it is, I mean, those are your champions. Those are the people you got to get referrals from and try to leverage that as well. So I think 
I don't know if that answers your question exactly, but no, it, uh, it, it definitely does. I appreciate that. I want to jump to Thomas because I think you brought up a good point and I wanted him to kind of give us a little bit more, maybe definition and explanation and maybe how their system would work from a drip campaign. Cause uh, from a, from maybe from a lead generation. So, you know, I would classify lead generation as maybe somebody comes to my website and they're, they're looking for information. And I say, Hey, if you put in your email address, you can get this, this, this cool PDF or whatever the case may be. And now they've, they've, they've volunteered their email address to me. Maybe they're not a customer yet. So this is a prospective customer. And, uh, and Kathy just kind of alluded to the drip campaign. What does that mean? And how does constant contact help to actually institute that? Because that it, from the, from the, just the title of it sounds a little complicated. Yeah, absolutely. Now, drip campaigns and welcome emails, there's uh, really a few different ways that you can do automation through the constant contact site and through a marketing platform like us. The main thing is going to be to engage with them based on them joining your list, like you said. And that can be something as simple as just a one-off welcome email with a link to a PDF or a video introduction or something that entices them and that immediate gratification of, I just joined, here's that email, that really increases that opportunity for engagement more than if they get an email a month later. You've got to be able to do that initial interaction, much like a follow-up phone call, but just an instant email. And then being able to incorporate that even further with segments or with um, list building, you are able to create series of emails to go out based on click activity. So if they click on a newsletter in or click on a link in your newsletter of a particular product or service, then you could trigger a series of emails to go out to them based on that activity or even based on them opening an email. They at least showed enough interest in clicking on the email to open it up and to read what you have to say. Rewarding them for that, getting an automated series to go out maybe with the coupon saying, hey, thanks for your interest. Here's 10% off, whatever the case may be. Those are some great ways for you to have a hands-free marketing strategy that you're able to incorporate to get people on board. And using things like polls and events and videos are going to really help entice that click rate and hopefully get them so that they see the expertise that you offer and are able to engage. Thomas, why would I want to use a service like Constant Contact or MailChimp or any of the other you know email marketing products out there versus using my Gmail and copying and pasting my thousand email contacts that I have and blind copying them on everything and just sending out the information that I want to send. What, why, why do I need to spend the time, energy and resources to use constant contact? Absolutely. Great question. So several reasons for that. Number one, I mean, it, it sounded like a lot of work, even just what you were describing <laughs> about having to copy and paste everything and blind carbon copy into your Gmails. But beyond that, a lot of times with Gmail, if you get up to hundreds of contacts that you're copying and pasting, that really increases your chance of going into spam folders, going into junk folders, and even getting reported and not even getting into any inbox at all if they've got security services in place like Norton or McAfee. Whereas if you use something like Constant Contact, I checked with our deliverability team a couple weeks back. They said that we're pretty consistent at about a, 70, a 97% delivery rate of emails going into the inbox. And so it helps you get into the inbox. You're able to do those blind carbon copies. And so that way it does still feel like a one-to-one -one relationship. But doing something like that and being able to do those segments, it's going to be, once you get everything laid out, it's going to be a lot smoother and it's going to help you get in front of more eyes in a much more consistent way because we have that team that you can reach out to that can help you with your delivery, help you understand the CAN Spam Act and what permission looks like and be able to give you the best practices to be able to be successful in your marketing. So obviously spam is, is a big component of it, but I, I, I would also, we, we utilize constant contact in our business. So I, I also understand some of the other benefits and, and, I, and I know Ken uses that as well. Tammy, is that what you guys use? as well. So what are the other benefits that, that I'll just kind of toss over to Tammy, some of the other benefits that you've seen for using a program like that versus just trying to send them all out through your inbox? Um, you know, again, I kind of came into the game late and I wasn't part of the, um, the initial getting of the emails. I don't actually work 
you know, at Bysher. Um, so I don't know who the clients are. I don't know who the customers are. I don't know how the emails were obtained. So when I'm putting something in, I'm just sending to a list that's already created in there and hoping to not I'm upset anybody by sending them something they don't want. Um, you know, I don't know. That's actually something that we've just kind of started the process of the conversations after all of these meetings that we've been doing with you guys, um, that we really need to be segregating our lists. And until then, we're kind of keeping everything blanketed to where we're, we're covering our bases with what we send out. Um, but I don't even know. I, again, we have so many subcategories in there that I don't know how we would do it if we didn't have something that automated it for us. So it, it kind of helps with the organization process. Ken, is that something that you go in and look at as far as like the open rates and, and that information? Or is that some, somebody else in your organization that handles that? No, I take a look at that. So our open rate is about 40% right now. 40, between 40 and 50%, which is pretty good from what I understand. Yeah, that's incredible. So the, it gives you the ability because when you if, if you're trying to do this through just your own you know inbox that you're sending out, then you're not actually going to be able to see necessarily who's opening it or who's taking action on it. They may never see it or they may see it and, and never respond. And that's really your only your, your only variable. So the, the all of the data and analytics behind it is really a major benefit of a program like constant contact. Uh, Kathy, I want to jump to you real quick and ask a question about how do you, cause I think uh, Tammy was just, was just kind of landing on this. How do you communicate with your customers without aggravating them and, and kind of pushing them away? Uh, trick question, right? Um, <laughs> most people, at least for my clients, we try to have a system where you opt in and my, some of my clients have some fancier email systems where you can opt into product information, but not promotional information. So, uh, you know, I'm a big, big fan of, of advocating for, for companies to actually have lists where there's a listserv where the person can actually decide what they want to get. Mm -hmm. uh, that being said, I get an email every day from William Sonoma and from a bunch of stock trading magazines that I subscribe to. And so, uh, you know, it's a gray area in terms of, you know, what you're sending. Um, but I think if you have a, a purpose and you have a list and you have people that fit a certain profile, you are going to get a few unsubscribes. Um, you know, if you're getting 40, 50% open rates, I'd be okay with a few people, you know, opting out at some point. So, you know, I, I think there's some, um, there's some beautiful templates in constant contact as well as some other software where you can make things look good. And if you have someone professional writing it, there has to be a reason for the email. What's the call to action? What are you trying to achieve? Is it informational? Is it for a referral? Is it for a customer survey? I'm a big fan of using email for, for customer follow-up for surveys. I think business owners love it when they see real um, comments and real feedback from somebody in a timely manner. So a lot of my clients start out with email with usually when you start out with a survey and you see the results, then you're all on board for the next thing because you realize what a valuable tool that is. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's important to have somebody that understands your business and understands the customer that's creating the message. That's for sure. That's interesting. Thomas, from, from your perspective, how do you not aggravate people when you're sending them email? <laughs> I mean, yeah, Kathy hit the nail on the head in, in regards to segmentation and making sure that you are making sure that the information is relevant to them and their specific need. I think that that's key. Having a minimalistic perspective when you're sending out those emails is going to be key, making sure that the emails are short. You probably have 60 seconds if you're lucky for the person to be able to read your newsletter. So if it's too long or if it's too wordy or boring or the subject line doesn't really entice them, then they're not even going to open up that email. But that sending consistency is also going to be key. That's probably something that Ken would say is going to be uh, part of what's been so successful for them is they've been able to be consistent. And it's almost that people are expecting that. And if there was a situation where they missed a month or something like that, I'm sure that they would get phone calls because that lack of consistency and that's going to be key as well as being able to get the consistency of not being too, not bombarding them too much with the inbox, like other places do where you get emails every single day, but also not getting forgotten. And so once a month is usually great, even biweekly, if you've got several different topics is a great way to get involved. 
And then, of course, keeping it so that it is um, timely with upcoming events or surveys or other ways that they can engage is a great way to keep them engaged as well. And then, of course, using like video content. I will I will give an example of, of another place. Um, I was talking to an HVAC company and they said that they started doing videos of home fixes, ways that people can um, work on their AC and work on fixing things. And they started presenting those videos to their customers. And, you know, on the surface, you would think that wouldn't be a good idea because then people wouldn't need to call them anymore, but it actually showed the expertise and it actually got them more calls because people were able to see, okay, these people know what they're talking about. These people know exactly what they need to do in the locksmithing business. These guys know everything they need to know about cameras, Mm. whatever the case may be. So if you're able to present even that information where you're almost giving them the keys and then seeing, showing them that expertise, those are some great ways to stay engaged and to help people be engaged with your content. I like that pun, Thomas. Give them the keys. So, it, I, so the, the, the answer there is, I guess, creating the valuable information, the tips, the how-tos that are going to be resourceful. Or instead of it just being a buy this, buy this, it's I'm going to give you some information that you can find valuable, give you some information that you can actually apply versus me just always asking for something. Is that is that kind of what you're saying is more of the give, less of the ask? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously the goal is to make money as well and to make those sales, but being able to balance that with the valuable information is going to be important as well. So that way they see the expert, they want to know what you know before they'll buy from you. And so having that balance is fantastic. So I I know Ken, uh, you mentioned Ken's consistency every month, but really the major value add for Ken's emails is the fact it has his picture on every single one of them. And so that's the reason that people open those up. Uh, That's why he has such a high, high open rate. But uh, Ken, you, you landed on having a monthly email newsletter. What was the reason behind that versus more regularity or weekly or what, what, what's been the, the purpose of the timeframe you're handling right now? You know, we, we decided to do monthly because it's it's not always easy to come up with content. So doing it monthly gave us enough time to to um, be able to select something and, and be able to get enough information to put out there. And one thing I, I will tell you about our, our open rate, um, something we talked about on the uh, 4 o'clock business meeting online, um, was our, our newsletter used to go out with a bunch of different topics. And because of um, one of our meetings, we, we lowered that to one or two topics and our open rate went from, it was, it was about 30%. And now, like I said, it's up to 40, almost 50%. And that's helped out a lot. That's very interesting. I, I do want to kind of hound on the topic of how, how often you should send out emails. So Kathy mentioned that she gets a daily email from William Sonoma which is awesome. You know, hopefully you're buying some really great kitchen equipment. I'm not. <laughs> it's, I'm not. It's just click by, click by, click by. I get an email every morning. Uh, there's actually a, a, a industry focused lawyer that sends out for many people. I'm probably sure uh, are familiar with him. He sends out an email every morning at six thirty five. I can literally set a clock by it um, and it pops up every morning at 635. And it is not a short specific email. It is a very, I actually pulled one up on my phone here. It is a very, very, very long email with lots and lots of information on it. And he sends that out every day. Now I want to be very specific. I don't read it every day. Right. I also have not unsubscribed to it. So why is that the case? Because I haven't quite figured it out. Like, why would I get this email that I don't read every day, but I also don't subscribe to it? And I'm interested <laughs> if for anybody to give me an answer, because I knew where it was at and I could go find it, but I'm not reading it. Right. I, I have 100,000 emails in my Google Gmail right now. I don't delete them either until until I max it out. And then Google tells me I have to delete them. <laughs> They go to my promotional file and they just sit there. I don't know. Maybe I think I'm going to find a golden nugget in there someday, but I don't think it's human nature to want to hit delete 40 times during your, you know, morning coffee email check. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm interested in this because he's obviously doing it for a purpose. So Thomas, what are you guys seeing from this? Like if somebody's sending an email out every single day like that, is their unsubscribe rate increase or is it based off of the content that they're sending out? So, I mean, it's a combination of both. I mean, he seems to know his demographic. And I mean, that's kind of the key as well is knowing who your audience is, researching who your group is. um, And if it makes sense for your 
for your group to send out a daily email, then that's fine. In your case and in the case of Sonoma and all of these other places, they're betting on the fact that you're not going to unsubscribe because you're afraid you're going to miss something. And so that's mm. their approach. And they'll throw a couple really good sales in between just to keep you honest and keep you on that mailing list just to see if something's going to come up. And that'll work for some marketing. I mean, some religious organizations do daily devotional. So there are times and places where something like that would make sense. But being able to understand from an unsubscribe perspective, we do see as a general rule, if you're sending out daily emails, that's bombarding and that does typically cause for higher unsubscribe rates and higher spam rates. We usually say no more than once a week, no less than once a month is the, is the sweet spot so that you can stay top of mind. If you're able to gather that content, if you're able to provide enough relevant information without being overloading, then that's usually the sweet spot of getting that information out. So, and kind of going back to, to Kathy's point on that, it's, um, it's depending upon uh, giving them the ability to choose the frequency at which they would like to have those emails come to them. So, hey, I'm cool. Send me an email every day based off of, you know, your hot items or based off of your how to list or whatever, but, or I want to select, I only want to hear from you once a month because I really, you're, you're obnoxious to me. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to see all that, but giving your, your customer base, the option to be able to select that frequency and then you be able to navigate that. So maybe only send me an email once a month based off of the summary of everything that you've talked about versus hitting me once a week or once every couple of days. Is, is that kind of what you're referring to Kathy? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's some sophistication even in constant contact where you can create a, create lists that are visible from a CRM and, and you can choose to name it whatever you want. If it's product information or the weekly specials or, or whatever it may be. Um, a lot of people don't need a locksmith until they get in trouble, right? So maybe those emails are handy when they go in their email box and try to search for something that says locksmith because they're locked out of their house on that given moment. Um, but yeah, I think constant contact, and you know, and I use some other ones that are, that are compatible with Salesforce. And, there's some really interesting uh, software out there for drip campaigns. And depending on when the customer opens the email that determines when the next one comes, like let's say you have a whole drip series that talks about uh, home security and you educate the customer every time they get an email. And if, if someone opens it tomorrow, that means the next one comes in two days, but if they don't open it in the next 12 hours, it, you can schedule it to go three or four weeks from now. So you can kind of, there's some really interesting things you can do based on what the user's engagement is. If those emails just stop, or if they come more frequent. So, you know, a lot of business owners, you know, if they have a marketing person, mm -hmm. you know, they should be up to speed on what their software can do. And if it can't do everything that we're all describing, you know, maybe it's time to look at something else. Gotcha. So I know Ken is, and I, I want to par partly answer this question. I know Ken is a, a man of action. And so when he decided that this is what he was going to do, he got the right people on in it and, and he, he started getting the emails going. And whenever he's made those decisions to do that, he, he has the ability and resources to, to do that for other businesses that are kind of getting started. And, and Tammy, I'd be interested to kind of understand some of the hurdles that you guys kind of went through. And I know you said that you kind of came into it late where you already had an account set up and the list was already there, but just the hurdles of kind of coming up with information and content, what was, what were, what were the ways that you had to navigate that? And maybe some advice that you would give for somebody else that's sitting there going, Hey, this is something that I want to do, but I'm not quite sure where I need to start. Um, yeah, well, so that's where we're at right now. Um, you know, we, we launched a couple of things out there just to kind of see how it worked. Um, I think that actually you're the one that says any action is better than inaction or something along those lines. Um, so we actually jumped out there and we tried something and it seems that the most successful for us was the newsletter, um, the what's happening at Bysher. Um, we have, we've started working on our list and we're trying to, get it to where we can send content specific to people that want it. But it really is just a, it's, it's a process because there was more than one person involved in the initiating of the emails. So trying to get everybody on the same page to know what they're interested in has been a, a bit of a challenge for us. Um, but trying to still stay active while we're figuring it out on our end so that at least the people that want the information are getting something from us. Very Just cool. That. Yeah. So Thomas, I wanted to ask you a question. Uh, what, where did you go? Like, where, where do you see 
people struggling with when they start up an account and maybe they, all right, cool. We've got an account. We got it started. And maybe we get our first email out and then all of a sudden it's, it's done. And what do I do next? What's, what's number two, or how do I create a path of consistency because it's an overwhelming process? Yeah, absolutely. Well, and the key for that is um, being able to use what you've learned and use the reporting. We talked about reporting earlier and being able to use that to your advantage. And when you get those click rates in that initial email, making sure that you are right on point with reaching out to them and reaching out to those opens and being able to use that information to your advantage. A lot of a big challenge for some, especially when they're getting started, is the growth opportunities and how they're able to grow their list in a permission-based manner. And so getting connected with putting a sign-up form on the website when you have one, getting everything on social media. We have uh, Google and Facebook ad capabilities to grow your your subscriber base and drive more traffic to your website through social media on that side of things. Again, remembering that the marketing suite is what you're wanting to do. Not putting all of your eggs in one basket, Mm -hmm. but putting everything together in one cohesive strategy. And so growing the list is usually the next step, making sure that there are several things like a text to join to get people to join your list via text message that they could see at events or when you're doing service calls, you can have it on business cards, whatever the case may be. And giving them as many opportunities to join as possible so that you can grow your list. And then finding that consistency you know, searching what works for other people. Um, We have an extensive knowledge base and a huge blog that goes through some best practices on that kind of information as well. So being able to use what other people have found successful to your advantage and then being able to do videos and other content to help give you some of those ideas and, and getting that information out. So growth and using the reporting to your advantage and then finding some trends and being able to piggyback on that to be able to get your information out as well. Would you say that one of the, uh, the one of the benefits is maybe, or maybe one of the, 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 the structure starting points is to just create a welcome email so that as soon as people join the list, that there's some type of a consistency there, because maybe your list, you have a hundred people on it and you're growing it, but you want every person, every new person to come on that has some type of, Hey, welcome. This is who we are. This is what we're about. Yeah. And this is kind of the future. And that, that just happens on its own. Every person that comes in gets that. Is that, is that a good starting point? Yep, absolutely. Uh, welcome email is fantastic. Um, that does give you about an 83% higher open rate statistically when it comes to getting people on board and having that instant gratification. You could even include a video right on that welcome email that talks about what you're doing, talks about um, why they should invest in you and even is a personal thank you of sorts. I mean, it wouldn't necessarily be directed at them specifically, but it could be a personalized thank you from the owner of the business that is on that welcome email with a coupon, just a way for them to feel like you're really wanting to engage, you really matter to them and they matter to you, I should say. And being able to use that in that welcome email fashion is fantastic. So I, this is very interesting. You've mentioned this, I think, four times now. A a video on the email. Why? What? What's your? What's your? Why do you keep bringing that up? What's the? What's the value of the video on the email? So the video on the email, depending on you who you ask, there are several statistics out there. The one that I had seen usually was ninety six percent higher click through rate if you have a video in an email versus not having a video in an email. And the most recent one that I saw said 300% higher click rate. Wow. And that was just in my stats this morning, what I was compiling to get some information for you guys. So that's why it's valuable to have video content, especially now with everything being so social distancing and not being able to have as much brick and mortar face-to-face interactions, being able to have those videos to kind of help guide people through what you're able to do, what your process is, what safety measures you're doing. Those are some things that will really help them feel comfortable with using you as their, um, as their, as their locksmith or as their security people to be able to get um, the business done that they need to. So it shows great value. And then you are able to also sync up blogs as well. So using what you've already built with the blog post and incorporating that into the body of your newsletter, those are some great ways for you to use what you've already put together and getting it out to your audience. Very interesting. All right. So those people that are, that are watching this or listening to this and they go, okay, hold on a second. 
I already have a blog on my website. I'm posting this out and I'm not going to send it out as an email. Why would you not send it out as an email? What is the reason not to do that? I, I it, that's you, you bring up a valid point video on an email, which I don't know that we've ever even discussed that in this, in this group, but video on an email and then you utilizing blog content. How is that a value add? <laughs> I mean, it's a value add because it shows the expertise. And if people aren't getting to your website, but they're on your mailing list, if they haven't visited, but they, you know, you had the one-on-one -on -one interaction, it's a way for you to be able to drive that traffic. Because ultimately the goal with an email is to drive traffic to your website, drive traffic to your business and getting people to call you and reaching them where they are. And so hitting them with blog content, hitting them with video content is going to number one, show your expertise, but number two, is going to just reiterate what they're able to get from you and be able to engage and get that information. Kathy, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, all my clients video really increases the open rate. It's been remarkable. And it could be video that you create or it could be video from the brand, you know, from the vendor. It's Eagle Eye Networks or it's an AV product or whatever, what have you. It doesn't have to be a video of the owner. In fact, a lot of people sleep through that stuff now. Um, but yeah, video is great. Um, drive everything. Like I said, it's not, it's nothing's linear, right? So you don't know where a prospect's going to come in. It could be from YouTube. It could be from a Google ad. It could be from a referral. It could be from, uh, you know, white pages. It, it could be anything. So I, I really, I, a lot of my clients are doing video and there's a lot of young people that are very good at video. Videos don't cost, you know, $10,000 a finished minute anymore. Um, but yeah, lo I love video. I think it's uh, very powerful and I see it with my client work too. $10,000 a finished minute. Ooh, I like that. Um, that was a long time ago. That was a long time ago. <laughs> Ken, what is uh, that information that they just talked about? What, what are your thoughts on that video in the email and then reuse, like basically using blog posts from your website to kind of drive traffic through email? Yeah. So I think the, uh, the video portion is awesome. We had a friend who did his first constant contact um, email blast and used a video of himself. And he basically introduced himself saying, you know, that um, he doesn't get out of the office very much and he wished he could meet all his customers, but this was his way of introducing himself to everybody. And then he, he t started to talk about his grandkids and he, he put it on a personal level, which I thought was awesome. And he had a, a great open rate. Yeah, it's, it was very, very interesting. So I think there's some ideas utilizing video and, and uh, the uh, Rob, who you're talking about, he just used his iPhone, set it up and recorded. So definitely not $10,000 uh, $10, per <laughs> finished minute, which so you can do it with anybody. He got it up on YouTube, published it in there. So great value add. I do want to do kind of a quick round the table, just kind of closing thoughts on um, you know, maybe some advice that you would give based off of uh, the conversations that you've had with people and maybe some just encouragement for anybody you know, you're talking to, to our industry, our security industry of saying, Hey, these are things you need to be aware of. These are things you need to be mindful of and maybe some encouragement on what, where they would want to start down this path. So I'll start with Kathy and then uh, we'll go to, to Tammy, Thomas and Ken. Sure. Sure. I would say learn email, start, start somewhere, start small, but start something focused. Uh, learn text. I can't tell you enough how many people want a locksmith appointment by text. Young people don't want to call on the phone. They just don't. My young kids are 20 and 18. They don't even check their email. But there's a lot of text out there, and I've seen it in some of the locksmith businesses where you can get an appointment or you can have someone call you via text. So email, yes. Text, yes. Facebook and LinkedIn, yes. Video, yes. All right. Thank you. Tammy, what are your thoughts? Closing thoughts, suggestions, encouragement. Um, well, I took a lot of notes because um, this was my first experience with this kind of uh, roundtable. Um, I think that for us, the biggest thing that we have have been using to go forward is is that any action is better than inaction. So we're trying things and, and we're launching them out there and hoping that they work. Um, I would expect you to see something with video in it soon, uh, since that seems to be going so well, according to everybody here. Very cool. Thomas. Yeah, absolutely. The biggest thing, and and it's been it's been said several times, but just getting there and doing something, not being discouraged if the first email doesn't quite get as much with as much uh, return as as you're hoping for, but being able to just really get started, get those gears turning, get those 
uh, sign up forms and, and ways that people can join your list in place. So that way you can have organic growth without you having to be boots on the ground, getting it. And then making sure that all of your content is mobile responsive because so many things are open on mobile now and making sure that that's nice and clean and crisp. And then obviously just stay strong and be able to continue that marketing presence and continue to be willing to learn and try new things as you're moving forward. Most definitely. Ken, what are your closing thoughts? So closing thoughts are if you're not doing something, do something as soon as possible. Um, it doesn't have to be perfect. If you're going to wait for something to be perfect and, and try to, you know, have a, a $10,000 minute final, um, <laughs> you'll never get anything out there. So just send it out. You know, your first one's not going to be perfect, but you'll get better as you do them. So just, just start today. It, it's a good thing. Very cool. I appreciate it. I, I can tell you, and, and even kind of going back to what Kathy was mentioning at the beginning, you know, understanding your client and understanding the ways that they're wanting to communicate. I can tell you from our perspective, we do a lot of Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, and email. And by far, our biggest connecting point is email. So like We've talked to our customers. We've talked to our uh, the, you know, our clients. How do you want us to communicate with you? And by far, they say email. That's the best way to get in contact with us. Does that mean we're going to move away from our social? No, because that's a way that we can continue to grow and expand our coverage and expand our presence. But our existing customers and the new customers that we're bringing in, that is a way that we can continually communicate with them, uh, which is which is a major value. So I would definitely encourage anybody that is not doing it, to start looking down that path um, and just get started. Start up with a welcome email, get it going, and it's going to kind of populate on its own and then you can start building from there. I've got two pages worth of notes here as well. I appreciate uh, everybody's time today. Obviously appreciate HL Flake for continuing to promote and sponsor these types of conversations to get it out there for our industry to help to communicate better ways that we can connect with our customers, better ways that we can we can improve our businesses and be more effective and more efficient with our resources. So uh, we appreciate HL Flake being for the locksmith, and we look forward to seeing you next time on the Security Professionals Roundtable.